bright light burned into Ann Petrov's eyes. He winced in slight pain as his pupils contracted to balance out the light with the rest of... Where was he? The question raced through his mind as his eyes darted in all directions, trying to make out any details to indicate any clue as to where he was. But all he could see was darkness, except for the light fixture hanging above him. He could feel his heart pulsing in his chest as he tried to sit up, realizing that his wrists and ankles were tied down to what seemed like was a recliner. He kicked down his legs, causing the chair to revert to its normal sitting position, bringing into view a small coffee table and an antique wooden chair that sat across from him, barely visible in the dim light from above. There was a small glass of water on the table and a small black orb next to it. You must be thirsty, a voice said from the darkness. Anne looked up in the direction the voice was coming from. It was a familiar voice. The rush of memories flooding back into his mind temporarily disoriented, causing a slight sense of nausea. The last thing he remembered was getting out of his Uber and walking up to his hotel room door before hearing a voice screaming at him and then blacking out after being sucker punched. He wanted to know where he was. He wanted to know who the voice belonged to. But as he went to speak, a sharp pain shot through his jaw. He painfully moaned as the voice spoke again. Hey now, take it easy. I don't think it's broken, but he did hit you pretty hard. The figure of a female slipped out of the shadows from behind the wooden chair. Ian noticed that her outfit was civilian in nature. He knew whoever she was, she was a professional, and he began to wonder if his life was in danger. Was this woman going to kill him? She sat down and pulled a straw out of her high-cut jean jacket pocket. She smiled, unwrapped it, and placed it into the glass as she held it up to Anne's mouth. Listen, first off, I just want to say sorry. Maybe getting that brute to lay you out on the account you were an abusive boyfriend was a little much. But hey, here we are. And I was pretty sure if I just walked up to you and started grilling you on Project Geigen, you weren't going to be as cooperative. Ian stopped drinking. He was not expecting that statement. How did she know about Project Geigen? Now all was clear. This is why he was here. And this is why he was still alive. Who are you? My name is Macy. And don't worry, I'm not going to kill you. However, I want you to know that I did slip a little truth serum cocktail into the water. It'll take effect momentarily. So in the meantime, you're probably wondering how I know about Project Geigen. The Godzilla Intelligence Global Assault Network. You can find out just about anything you want on the dark web these days. So I'll tell you what I know, and you can fill in the gaps. Then after that, you can go, and I'll never bother you again. Deal? Ian began to feel the serum working on him. He struggled to keep his wits about him. Your name is Ann Petrov. Your father was from Russia, and your mother was from the States. They met and settled down in Canada, where they had you and your little sister, Ava. After she passed away from cancer, you went on to graduate university with a degree in biomechanical engineering, dedicating your life to finding a cure. You began working on integrating nerve and tissue with robotics. Interesting that I couldn't find out anything on who your investor was, except a Russian bank that the funds were transferred from. You were on the verge of a breakthrough when the San Francisco event happened, and then you disappeared for two years into Russia. Now you've been back for a year and haven't touched anything to do with your degree. Hell, you work in a pet store. So here's where you fill in the blanks. Ian was impressed with how much she already knew about him, but not once did she mention Project Geigen. He gestured for another drink of the water. Why not? He already felt the compound working, making him feel more eager to fill in the gaps. Might as well quench his thirst if he was going to be forced to break the oath he swore to the Russian government. 
that probably meant the end of his life. But after knowing what he knew, he didn't care anymore. He swallowed one more sip and sat back in the recliner. This world doesn't belong to us. It never did. We were left to care for it while they slept. But what did we do? We destroyed it. We pillaged its resources, warred over its lands, and killed the very life it created. And now they have returned to take it back. And I'm not so sure they're going to be happy with what we've done. Macy sat back, crossing her arms and legs. What is Project Gigan? Project Gigan was initiated after the creatures made their appearance in Hawaii back in 2014. The project's purpose was to gather intelligence on possible ways to defend against Godzilla should he threaten the Russian territories. Ever since the 1970s, the Russians have been gathering information from sources all over the world. They knew the Americans had found Skull Island and knew about these creatures as well. The whole Cold War was a cover-up for what was really going on. The Russians knew about the secret agency Monarch too, <laughs> and they thought they were being super secret. But realizing that, bringing the existence of these ancient creatures to the public would only cause mass hysteria, the Russian government decided to address the issue by other means. All of their satellites, all of their military outposts around the world, their advances in military technology and science, all of it for one reason, to prepare for these creatures coming. With the internet in its current state, it was easy for them to gather intel. They were even able to get their hands on some samples of Godzilla's tissues from ground zero. And then they recruited me to help them develop anti-Godzilla countermeasures. Macy nodded her head with a smile. So they're just piggybacking off of Monarch then? Ian shifted in his restraints as he shook his head in response to Macy's question. Not exactly. After the Battle of San Francisco, the Russians hacked into Monarch's network and took command of the satellites they were using to track Godzilla. After he disappeared into the Pacific, they ran a continuous loop of misinformation on Godzilla's current location. The next time Godzilla would actually appear would be three weeks later. He appeared at Chelyabinsk and made his way to Chernobyl. Naturally, the Russian government suppressed any information about Godzilla landing in Russia. Nothing for the media, nothing for the internet. He spent a few days deep inside the radiation zones, though. They assumed he was feeding off the high levels of radiation after his battle. And when he was finally finished, they had noticed that all of his wounds had completely healed. Then he headed back to Chilyabinks and vanished. Macy leaned forward, letting her curiosity shine through her facial expressions. She raised the half-empty glass, gesturing for Ian to take another drink as she continued her interrogation. How did Godzilla just vanish? Does he have some sort of active camo we didn't know about? Ian chuckled as he struggled to swallow his mouth full of water without choking. Ha! Thank God he doesn't have that or we'd never find him. No, apparently the meteor that fell in 2013 opened up an access point to one of those underground passageways like those found on Skull Island. But that's not all the meteor brought with it. The official reports state that it was a small meteor, but in fact it wasn't much smaller than Godzilla himself. But what was inside? was even bigger. Ian jerked with excitement. Then he looked down at his restraints and made a sad face. He turned to Macy with the most pitiful look he could muster. Can we get rid of these? They're really starting to hurt. Macy couldn't help but chuckle a little as she sat back in the wooden antique chair. Only after you tell me what was in the meteor. Ian smiled as the truth serum was now in full effect, throwing away his inhibitions. Monsters don't exist on just this planet. The whole reason the Russians recruited me for Project Gigan was because of what they found. A perfectly preserved corpse of a creature not of this world. Of course, it wasn't complete. Most of its body had been what seemed like mangled or torn apart or whatever. Its forearms were missing, and so were parts of its other appendages and pieces of its body. 
but its skeletal structure was still intact for the most part, and even some of its tissue had survived frozen. Its DNA was unlike anything on Earth. After I began to study its properties and structure, I found that it had the ability to assimilate inorganic material into its DNA sequence. The mandate of the project changed after this discovery. They wanted a deterrent shouldn't Godzilla or any other monster make landfall on Russian soil. They wanted a weapon. And my mind changed. Instead of looking for a cure, I dedicated myself to stopping these monsters. So my logic was simple. If we couldn't stop Godzilla, then there wouldn't be a world to find a cure for. My colleagues started calling me Frankenstein. I spent months building their weapon. I guess it would be better to call it a monster. I didn't even get to name it. They decided to simply call it Gigan. Macy glanced down at the black metallic orb sitting next to the glass. Was it time to use it? She wondered to herself. The glass was only half empty, but the serum seemed to be working to full effect. Still, she needed him to be relaxed, to trust her. She still had a lot of questions, and it would be easier to gather this information if her captive was cooperative. She reached down to the glass once more. Wait, they didn't let you name it? Those jerks. Ian smiled as he took another drink while Macy held the glass for him. Well, a deal's a deal, Macy said while she placed the now empty glass on the table. Then she got up and walked over to Ian, who was pushed back deep into his recliner, fearing what his captor was about to do to him. She loosened the restraints around his wrists until they were completely off. She smiled at Anne. Then, with her eyes, she gestured down to her waist. Anne followed her gaze and noticed she had a gun tucked into the rim of her jeans. I already told you I wasn't going to kill you, and you did answer my question. But no funny business, okay? Anne gave her a look of relief and nodded his head in compliance. Macy took her seat in the wooden chair again as Anne looked deep into her eyes. He was still puzzled at the brilliant blue that hued her iris. How was she connected to all of this, he wondered. Just some random girl who knew things the rest of the world is still in the dark about? Who was she? You said your colleagues called you Frankenstein. Why would they call you that? Come on, you're telling me you don't know the story of Dr. Victor Frankenstein? Macy chuckled as she gave in a look of disamusement. Heh. <laughs> well, in the story, the good doctor creates life by sewing together a human being and blasting it with lightning. It was one of my favorite books. And that was me, more or less. After initial tests on tissue samples, we found that it reacted with nuclear radiation in a most curious manner. It increased its rate of assimilation. It took me months, but I finally cracked the code, and with careful genetic manipulation, and of course filling in the gaps of the genetic code with DNA from the Godzilla cells, I was able to fuse a small robotic arm with a sample of the alien tissue. It was a glorious day. Too bad I would never win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> it was only months after that we started to build the rest of Gigan. Of course, the Russians wanted a luxury model, so we added some weapon systems. We knew conventional weapons wouldn't work, so we had to think outside the box. We outfitted his forearms with the lightweight titanium scythe-like sickles, and we did the same to its feet as well as other missing parts. Above its optics unit, we embedded a new electromagnetic projectile weapon that the Russians had been working on. But the best part was its brain. The first ever semi-organic AI-controlled brain complete with cybernetic enhancements, allowing it access to any system it needed to gather intel and form strategies in real time to combat Godzilla. I still remember its first battle. 
Ian inhaled deep and exhaled with a wide grin across his face as he sat back in his recliner. You can still remember it? Like it happened yesterday. I felt like a proud parent, you know. Macy leaned forward and picked up the small metallic orb that sat next to the empty glass. Holding it in one hand, she began to caress it with her other hand as she sat back in her chair. Ian was puzzled at the small black object. What was it? I'm glad. I'd like to see it for myself. Huh. <laughs> I wish you could have. It was such an awesome sight to... Ian's words disappeared into his throat as his attention was taken by a bright light shining through small cracks that began to open up all over the orb's surface as his breath was taken away by its beauty. The light began to intensify rapidly as it covered Macy completely, and soon Ian realized that he was completely covered in its light as well. It's the same color as her eyes. The thought raced through his mind as the light overtook him. And then, in the blink of an eye, he found himself at the observation post where he had witnessed the titanic battle between his creation and Godzilla. But how? He looked around, observing his surroundings. He could see his colleagues and other Project Gigan personnel shuffling around their instruments. And in the distance, he could see the floodlights that had been positioned around the crater leading to the underground passageway Godzilla had been using. I know you may have questions, but I need you to focus. This is a simulation and it'll show us your memories. Everything and everyone here is a memory and can't hurt you. So whatever happens, remember, you're safe. Ian looked over to his left to find Macy standing next to him. Her eyes were a brilliant shade of neon blue now, practically glowing. His head swelled with questions, but he felt compelled to do as Macy had suggested. He turned his gaze back to the site, which would soon become a battleground. The sky was pitch black, illuminated by the light of the full moon and the blanket of stars, which seemed to never end. The breeze was cold, just like he remembered. Then, off in the distance, the sound of propellers beating in the wind grabbed his attention. He watched as Gigan came into view, hovering over the massive entryway his body suspended by massive tow cables attached to a half dozen Osprey aircraft. I remember how tense everyone was. We all were wondering what the outcome would be. We calculated a 72% chance of success, but that was a large margin of error. Still, I was hopeful. I didn't just create a weapon, you know. I created a whole new life form. And it was magnificent. Ian's statement was cut short when the pair heard the ever-familiar sound of the ancient god approaching. We registered slight seismic activity as Godzilla approached. Our predictions were right, and the beast had come, and we were ready. I remember watching as the floodlights simultaneously flickered out as to not alert Godzilla to our presence. Gigan had crouched low on all fours as if it was a lion ready to pounce on its prey. I remember wondering just how much information had it accessed. Its movements were very animalistic in character. Had it developed a new subroutine in its programs? I was beside myself in awe with what I had created. And then he appeared. Godzilla broke the threshold of the hole in the ground, letting out a massive roar. Macy thought to herself, that's his warning, as she watched Godzilla pull himself to his feet just outside the crater, the moon's light highlighting the unique patterns in his maple leaf-like dorsal plates. The giant took a step forward and began to sniff the air. Macy could see that Godzilla sensed something was not right. Then suddenly, the floodlights flashed on, blinding the behemoth temporarily. Macy could hear Godzilla cry out in confusion as Ian began to speak. This was it. 
This was the moment Geigen would show the whole world that it truly was alive. Macy's attention was pulled away from her captive as Geigen let out an unearthly cry before leaping at the flank of the still disoriented Godzilla. Macy watched as Geigen's sickle-like forearms buried themselves into Godzilla's shoulder and thigh, a red ichor gushing from each puncture site. Godzilla roared in pain as Geigen used its forward momentum to push itself up and over the behemoth, twisting its grip and pulling Godzilla down on its other side with a thunderous boom. The cyborg then ripped its claws away from Godzilla's hide as it let out a menacing alien roar. Macy felt her heart sink into her stomach. Surprising herself, she began to wonder if Project Geigen would succeed. Could this weapon actually kill Godzilla? She watched as Geigen loomed over the wounded god. Godzilla swung his head around, finally getting a clear view of his assailant. And in the same moment he realized, Geigen was bringing his claws down to strike the death blow. The giant quickly rolled out of the way as Geigen's sickle-like claws came crashing down, heaving up dust and snow. Macy had noticed the heavy snowfall as she watched Godzilla, still on the ground, swing his thick tail around, knocking Geigen off balance, causing the mechanical alien to crash to the ground head first. A brilliant blue light filled the area when the dorsal plates running up Godzilla's spine had begun to glow as it made its way to its feet. Geigen shrieked at Godzilla as it scrambled to defend itself from the oncoming attack. Godzilla's atomic breath met the sickle-like claws as Geigen attempted to defend itself by throwing its arms up in a defensive stance. Macy noticed the movements were now more human-like as it struggled to keep the attack at bay and regain its footing. Snow began to melt around the two monsters as the atomic breath began to overheat the titanium arms of the otherworldly cyborg. Geigen cried out in pain as it swung its tail, giving it enough momentum to leap out of the way from the beam as it crashed into the snow-covered ground below. Macy noticed how one of its sickle-like arms was severely damaged by its melted appearance. Suddenly, a flash of light appeared just above Geigen's head, followed by a loud sonic boom. In the same breath, Macy watched as Godzilla flew backwards as if it were struck by an enormous battering ram. Cries of pain could be heard from miles as Godzilla rolled to a stop. Dust clouds and kicked up snow added to the already low visibility caused by the blizzard that was now in full effect. Godzilla struggled to his feet when it heard another sonic boom. Not even a second later and Godzilla fell to the ground, the wind knocked out of him. Macy watched as a distressed Godzilla flailed around on the ground, clawing at its chest where the projectile had hit. Geigen let out a roar as it closed the distance between it and its prey. Macy noticed that one of its mandibles had been chipped away, causing the already alien-looking creature to look even more menacing. Moments later, it was hovering over the beaten god. It slammed one foot onto Godzilla's chest and roared with a triumphant metallic cry. Suddenly, it felt itself lose its balance as Godzilla twisted its leg at the knee and rolled. Geigen came crashing down over top Godzilla in a cacophony of roars and cries. Now Godzilla was straddling the technological abomination, one leg on each arm. Macy noticed Godzilla had also managed to completely snap the leg in half, breaking it at the knee. Godzilla, growling, stared deep into the singular red eye that made up Geigen's optical sensor. Suddenly, dust and snow exploded upwards in a reverse mushroom cloud, following a flash of light and a sonic boom. 
Macy waited as the smoke and dust began to settle. She heard Geigen cry out, and then suddenly it was silenced by another loud explosion. All Macy could see was an eerie blue light through the dust and snow. She heard Godzilla cry out as Ian began to speak. They say it's always hard to see your children fail. We didn't know Godzilla's ability to generate nuclear pulses, so we couldn't hold it against him. But we all felt the sting of the defeat, but none more so than my precious Gigan. Macy turned to face Ian, noticing tears running down the side of his face. But remember what they teach you in school when you're a kid and you fail? You just gotta get up and try, try again.